very much, Jim. Uh, Oliver, my, my congratulations on your impeccable timing, scheduling this conference in an island of uh, tranquility while a historic storm uh, rages, uh, about to rage on the eastern coast, northeastern coast of the U.S. And another storm, uh, a political one, uh, uh, raging on the uh, southeastern coast of Euroland, uh, hopefully not to become a historic economic one. But I certainly enjoyed uh, Mark's remarks. Uh, he focused on uh, the global scene with a good deal on, on the weakness in Europe. Uh, I hate to disappoint you, Mark, but I agree with your fundamental conclusion. The, the theme in FX markets for some time to come is going to be dollar strength. Part of that is weakness abroad, of course, but uh, a good part of it also is uh, strength in the U.S. So, uh, <clears throat> to advance to the next slide here, let's see, is this working? Okay, uh, let's, let's go back to the outline. So, what I'm going to do is, is go through a number of slides a little quickly. We, we promise the package to you if you want to study in more detail on your own later, but uh, I'll uh, focus primarily on strength in the U.S., uh, implications for uh, the economy, the slow recovery, consumer finances, housing shortage, capex shortage, a friendlier fiscal environment, uh, uh, financial uh, uh, conditions, uh, and the exception on strength in the U.S. being uh, external drag. We'll look a little bit at uh, labor markets and inflation, uh, the Fed and the markets, and talk, if we have time, on risk and conclusions. Now, I'll do so through the eyes of a, a, a private market economist, one who also spent two and a half decades at the Fed, some of that time, fortunately, uh, in an office next to Janet Yellen's in a division of international finance in the late 70s. So I, I, I have an appreciation for the, what they're wrestling with right now, and, and the analysis I'm going to give you probably very much in line with the sort of thing that she's hearing uh, day in and day out. Uh, now, it's been an unusually slow recovery for the U.S. economy, uh, uh, going back five years, uh, looking at where we are currently uh, third quarter, as of third quarter 2014, relative to the average U.S. Uh, expansion, we're about halfway where, to where we should be if we had been following the average. Now, this slow recovery has afforded us time, uh, let's go back here, to uh, do some fundamental rebalancing, looking at the household balance sheet, the, the line on the bottom here, the debt to income ratio, uh, has come back down significantly, uh, and that has helped boost the overall, uh, the bottom line for the average household's balance sheet, the wealth to income ratio, as debt declined initially, uh, net worth, assets minus debt divided by income rose. Most recently, the rise in net worth has been more than asset side story with the stock market and the housing market, but this has gotten us back to close to pre-crisis peaks, an amazing uh, performance. Uh, helps the upper in income side of the uh, household sector especially, but that, that sector does account for a large share, uh, disproportion disproportionately large share of consumer spending. So it is a plus for consumer spending. But looking more broadly through the household sector, uh, thanks to the deleveraging, thanks to the low level of interest rates, debt service burdens are now at an all-time low, uh, suggesting further strength uh, in consumer spending going forward. I agree fully. Uh, that the re latest retail sales number is, is not uh, a key indicator. Um, looking next at the housing sector, uh, we had quite a bubble in housing build up during the, uh, during the excesses uh, pre-crisis. We've now worked through that bubble. Uh, vacancies, the number of vacancies in housing well below trend, heading toward a new low. Uh, and uh, that uh, is because home building has stalled at a too low a level. Uh, home builders, uh, the, 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 <coughs> the res investment of share of GDP, the red line here is uh, normally running above 4% of GDP to keep pace with the growing population. Uh, it of course has uh, stalled well below that. Home buildings, however, feeling pretty good about things. The, the home builder sentiment index has bounced back uh, and there are good reasons for that. The housing market is tightening. Uh, Home inflation uh, has, has uh, come back down off its uh, pre-crisis initial bounce, but it's still significantly positive. Home prices rising substantially in real terms still. 
Uh, and more importantly, rental inflation continues to rise at a pretty good pace. This is going to support core inflation in, in the near term, but, but certainly the tightening of the housing market, the low, decline in vacancies uh, evident in, in the price action. Turning next to the capital spending sector, uh, the growth of the stock of business capital in the U.S. is still, even after an initial bounce from the recession, still near historic lows prior to uh, this most recent cycle. Uh, the recovery of business investment still has a significant uh, ways to go, and that, we think, will be supporting spending going forward. Because of the low growth of the capital stock, capacity utilization is now back pretty close to norm, despite this... Uh, unusually sluggish recovery, uh, and we will see some further increase and increases in inflation pressure as, as uh, uh, shortages on the capital begin to become more the theme uh, in the years to come. So we do see business spending uh, another significant plus. Uh, a final element in the picture on business spending is one of the factors that has held it back has been discord in Washington, uncertainty about tax policy, uncertainty about uh, health care reform, et cetera. Um, but the picture has become noticeably friendlier overall. The Baker, Bloom, and Davis Economic Policy Uncertainty Index back down to pre-crisis levels. Uh, certainly this, another factor, uh, tending to uh, uh, pave the way, we think, for some business spending ahead. Um, on the theme about things in, in Washington looking better, another plus for the economy is the fact that fiscal drag is now much reduced. 2012 and 2013 were disappointing years, very importantly because the amount of fiscal drag, the amount of tax increase and spending cuts that we faced uh, those two years, it dropped off significantly uh, last year, it will drop off significantly further this year, and we think by 2016 will be a net plus, particularly as spending by state and local governments uh, begins to pick up. Uh, <coughs> sorry. The, uh, uh, a, a final supporting factor for the economy, financial conditions, broadly speaking, uh, measuring a number of uh, uh, financial and asset price, uh, fin asset price and uh, commodity price, uh, home prices also in this index, uh, generally supportive of the economy. One of the key elements there is oil price, the drop in oil prices, an impressive more than 50% decline. Mark talked a little bit about this. We think oil prices are about to bottom, somewhere in the $40 uh, to $50 bar per barrel range, some uncertainty around that. But uh, certainly there are implications, both positive and negative. We think the positive dominate. I've given you here uh, the exposure of various elements of the economy and the financial markets to, to oil, if you will, the oil patch, oil and gas. Uh, as a share of consumption, um, we're talking about about 2.5% of GDP uh, going to uh, gasoline, gas and oil purchases by households. Um, as a share of investment, the amount of investment that the oil sector draws on, uh, both the oil and the oil supplying sector, uh, you're talking about 0.8% uh, of GDP, substantially smaller. Uh, that's a negative. Uh, the, the positive for consumer, we think, clearly outweighs. And the impact on employment is even smaller. We're talking about a half a percent of GDP. Now, if you listen to financial markets, it's a bigger deal. Uh, certainly, the stock market is more exposed at 9% of cap uh, in the oil and gas sector. Uh, the uh, uh, corporate bond market even more exposed. So uh, overall, we think that financial markets are uh, pretty close to a wash here. The, the parts of the economy that benefit from lower oil prices uh, will be uh, offsetting much of the negative uh, on, on financial markets. But, uh, Bottom line on oil, it is a plus for the economy because of the dominance of the consumer share relative to the investment share. Uh, final theme on, on financial conditions is the dollar has clearly been a negative uh, with the dollar rising 10% uh, <coughs> uh, over the last uh, six months, uh, led of course by the euro uh, and the yen. I'll come back to this uh, later. I certainly agree with the notion that uh, this trend is continuing. Uh, <coughs> I will note that the drag from the dollar has been to a significant off extent offset by the foreign influence on the U.S. Treasury market. Uh, that 10% that, uh, rise in the dollar, if you run it through the Fed's model, 
has about uh, as much a big a negative impact on the on GDP, something like half a percent on GDP over the next year, uh, as the 80 roughly not, uh, basis point decline in the 10-year yield, much of which, as Mark suggested, has been driven by foreign demand uh, because of the very low level of interest rates uh, uh, in Europe uh, and, and action by the ECB now. Um, so broadly speaking, foreign influences through financial uh, uh, channels roughly a wash despite the drop in the dollar. Uh, this is something that is not being lost on the Fed and will enter into their uh, decisions going forward. Uh, bottom line for the economy, if you look at the last line on this chart, real GDP growth, we think this year a little, uh, little above 3% compared with moderately below 3% last year, about a half a percent increase. Um, and looking at this in colors uh, across the sectors contributing to GDP growth, uh, looking at 2014, 2015, uh, the theme is consumer, of course, is the, is the lion's share of GDP growth. We do see overall investment, including residential and non-res, uh, continuing to make significant contribution. The shift, uh, the thematic shift in growth here going forward is one from uh, net exports, which had uh, been a, a positive 2012, 2013, a modest negative 2014, becoming a bigger negative going forward because of the relative strength of the U.S. economy driving imports uh, compared to exports. Uh, uh, hurt a little bit by the weaker picture abroad and, of course, by the stronger dollar. Um, now, at, at, keep in mind that that uh, impact on the 10-year yield doesn't affect through net exports. It's more through the domestic economy, through consumer spending and uh, investment. Uh, the other theme here is that government goes from a negative uh, to a bigger positive uh, going forward, as I said, state and local spending picking up. Let me turn next now to the implications of this strong growth picture for the labor market, for inflation, and the Fed. Uh, no question, the labor market's been doing very well, at least looking at it from the side standpoint of employment growth, uh, average monthly payrolls, uh, up over, around 250 now for the last year, and up in the uh, nearing 300 over the last three months. We don't expect it to continue at 300, but certainly something uh, noticeably in the neighborhood of 200 plus, very achievable if our economy is growing at 3% plus. Um, now that uh, has implications for the unemployment rate. I've given you here the FOMC median projection for unemployment, the red line, uh, red dots uh, going forward, uh, and then two very simple calculations. If labor force participation is flat, population continues as it has, it has over the last five years to grow around 1%, uh, and payroll employment grows somewhere between 200 and 250, we'll see that unemployment rate decline significantly faster than the Fed is projecting. Uh, we'll be down uh, the better part of a percentage point over the next year, moving us into the mid-fours. Uh, now, the Fed has been under-predicting all along the drop in unemployment, and this is one reason why uh, an earlier Fed uh, exit is very much in the cards, I think. We'll come back to that uh, a little later. But uh, the, the, the reason why people are concerned here is uh, uh, what's happening on the wage inflation front is a mixed picture. The latest number in December, uh, the drop in, in average hourly earnings, I think was a transitory uh, weather-related factor in part, uh, if you look at the year-over-year -year number. I agree with Mark, the, the number coming out on Friday for employment cost index will be a critical number for the Fed going forward. We think it's going to be modestly positive, uh, which will help on our, our feeling that we get a June uh, liftoff, but I'll come back to that again. Uh, the more important number here, I think, uh, as I said, is, is the red line as opposed to the black line. Black line is that, uh, comp that uh, uh, average hourly earnings. Red line is is ECI. Looking at the ECI index a little more closely, uh, it, it did rise to almost 2.3 percent year over year uh, as of uh, Q3 uh, and up close to 3 percent over the last two quarters. Uh, we, we do think it's rising a bit further. A couple other indicators, the NFIB survey of small business, if you look at the household surveys on expected earnings increases, they're all kind of pointing in the upward direction as one would expect for a labor market is tight, that is tightening. The uh, uh, unemployment gap, the green line in this chart, uh, with a six-quarter lead, 
does a pretty good job, roughly, of telling you which way wage inflation is going. I've, I, I've shown you here the average hourly earnings. Um, we do think that this is going to be moving upward because of the tightening labor market. That will feed, importantly, into the Fed's decisions. Uh, another factor very important into the Fed's decisions is the behavior of inflation expectations. A lot of attention in the market on, on the longer dated tips break-evens, the black line in this chart, which have dropped pretty impressively. But the two key survey measures, the red line, the Michigan survey, ten, five to ten year, and the survey professional forecasters, I happen to be one of these guys. I listen to what the Fed's telling me they're going to do in the long term. I say 2%. Uh, that number, I think, is going to stay close to 2%. Um, I think the red number, uh, the red line, uh, is going to be, does some risk around the drop in oil prices, but it's, it's remarkable to stay uh, where it has so far. And I think so long as it does, uh, that affects Fed's decision uh, on timing uh, toward the June, in the June to, June to September uh, window. Uh, <clears throat> moving forward. Let's see, not sure if we're, okay. Um, <clears throat> final element in Fed's decision is, is uh, consumer price. And one of, the, one of the factors that I think has affected this, uh, this concern about timing move things towards September and the general expectation is the fact that core inflation, core PCE inflation and CPI uh, most recently have, have begun to dip a bit. We do expect the headline inflation number to drop below zero on a year-over-year -year basis uh, in the not-too-distant future, given what's happened to oil prices. They won't fall quite as far as they will in Europe, but we're going to see some significant negatives there. Question is, how far does core inflation drop? If it gets down to one, its, it's uh, latest is 1.4. If it gets down to 1.2, one, 1.3, one, can the Fed look through that? If it drops further into the 1.0, one, 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 then that becomes a little more problematic, and I think they, they put things off. But uh, uh, turning to the Fed and the timing here, if we can advance one more slide, uh, uh, I've given you here the, uh, the dots chart with, with uh, bracketed by a couple other forecasts. The dots in the middle, the December FOMC median projections for the Fed funds rate uh, suggest uh, we're going to be above 1% by the end of this year, which means uh, you pretty much have to lift off around June, maybe July, if you're going to skip a meeting at all uh, and, and, have, uh, uh, and get to what they're expecting. Now, I've also given you uh, a hollow dot, not labeled, which is my guess about where Janet is uh, on, the, on the dots chart. She is probably a bit below the median. Um, uh, but still, at a, uh, my guess would be at 1% as the upper end of the, uh, uh, the target range for the end of this year. Uh, as of December, uh, and I don't think things have changed enough to suggest that she will have changed uh, her views since then, uh, and I don't expect we'll learn anything uh, at the meeting this week. Uh, the Fed will take a pass and, and not really change its uh, statement much. Uh, but there are two uh, interesting uh, alternative views, if you will. Uh, one is what the Fed would have done historically, given where unemployment and inflation are right now, uh, they'd be up around 3% on the Fed funds rate if you took the average Fed tightening cycle in the past. Of course, things have changed a bit, uh, and this is not an average or a normal period. But at the other extreme, you have the current, the, la the recent market expectations, the range whether you use the Fed funds futures or the euro futures, you're somewhere um, uh, approaching by uh, 2017 more than a full percentage point below even Janet's dot, if you will. Uh, on, on that one. So I think there is some major adjustment in expectations coming, whether it's the economists or whether it's the, uh, uh, the, the, the market. Uh, I tend to think, uh, based on my view about, uh, based on our uh, <coughs> historical, if, if historical relationships of uh, supply and demand uh, reassert themselves, uh, I think it's going to be uh, some, particularly some upward revision in these, these rate expectations in the market. So. Uh, to advance toward the, uh, to come back to uh, a chart you've already seen and to reinforce the basic conclusion, this uh, strength in the U.S. is, I agree, fully uh, going to be giving us a, a, uh, a further significant uptrend 
Uh, Draghi said at least until mid-2016 will they be uh, purchasing uh, involving, uh, uh, <coughs> involved in QE at the ECB. Uh, the Fed will be well on the way to raising rates by then, so uh, the dollar does go significantly higher. I agree fully that uh, the euro goes below parity. Uh, I won't give a date there either, but certainly over the next couple of years we can, we can expect to see that. Um, and uh, uh, to, to finish up, uh, just give you a couple, if we can advance again, I'm not, okay, and just, uh, how are we doing on time? Just, just a, a word or two about risks. Uh, there are some downside risks, maybe I'll let you read these at your leisure later, but uh, uh, certainly the, the weakness abroad spilling over in the U.S. and discouraging investment in the U.S. is a, a negative, uh, a significant negative, uh, potentially, uh, risk. Um, and on the upside, maybe bouncing ahead, <coughs> come back a slide, oops, there is a lag in the uh, uh, clicker here. Uh, <coughs> well, I'm not sure if I'm doing this or something else is, okay, well, let's, let's just go straight to the conclusions. I'll let you do the downside at your, at your uh, leisure. Um, so we do see the U.S. economy as uh, certainly on track for 3% growth for the period ahead with consumer and improved household finances as a key driver. <clears throat> uh, we think resi and uh, business investment will be contributing as well. Uh, the labor market under these circumstances will certainly be tightening further. Unemployment moving uh, below, ne below Nehru uh, this year. It's already within the Fed's range of Nehru, although that, that range probably will be revised down a bit. Uh, wage inflation is beginning, we think, to stir upwards. Uh, inflation will be certainly subdued for the time being, uh, but not indefinitely. Uh, weak oil, oil prices and strong dollar are holding it down for, for much of this year, but certainly not into next year. Uh, we think stable inflation expectations and rising wage inflation will be, uh, uh, will be keeping the Fed on its toes. Uh, and uh, I do expect liftoff in the June to September for, um, period with, with uh, the June still li slightly more likely than, the, than later on is our, our view. Uh, this is certainly well ahead of uh, market expectations. Um, once they do start raising rates, it'll be slower than normal initially, but I think uh, as inflation pressures begin to build in 2016, you'll see something uh, a little more aggressive. Uh, under these circumstances, no question, the, the dollar trends higher. Uh, driven by this economic picture in the U.S. And, and let me stop there. We may have time for a question or two. Good morning. Luc, Luc de la Durante, CIBC Asset Management. Peter, um, what about the, there's a line of thinking that says um, that during the crisis, wages have not fallen as much as would have expected given the depth of the crisis. And then, therefore, on the way back up, they will all also be sticky on the way up and mm -hmm. slow. So, hence the mm -hmm. um, expectation from the Fed that might be pushed for, further out. Yeah, no question. This this issue of pent up wage uh, deflation is certainly alive and well. Uh, our models tell us that we probably work through most of that, and going forward. Uh, it, so, this is why we expect to begin to. We, why we think that the recent slight uptrend in the ECI is, is not a, a false uh, positive at this point. So no question, wages did not fall as much as you would have expected. I think there's some models that say we still have further to go on that. Uh, others uh, that we've looked at say we've worked uh, most of the way through it. If I may have another one. Uh, in one of the um, beginning charts, you have net worth over income. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any concern, if you notice, it's back up to close to historical levels. Some would interpret that as a, another valuation measure where you say net worth, in other words, stock, bonds, housing, as a share of income is, at, is back at its peak. We've never been able to go beyond that. It's a sign of overvaluation of asset prices again. Keep in mind that uh, there were sort of two phases in that that return of net worth to its near previous peak. Uh, and no question that the previous peaks were bubbles. Um, part of that, though, is, was the, the, the uh, uh, <clears throat> drawdown of uh, debt. Uh, the deleveraging of households has been pretty impressive. We've gone from a peak of 140% of income to about 100. Uh, so that factor, plus 
I think if you look at valuations in the stock market, it doesn't, I mean, there's some models that say things are rich. Uh, our analysts think that things are about, look okay at this point. And certainly there's no, no issue that uh, housing is overvalued at this point. Nothing like it, it got to in the previous peak. And most of the bubble in the previous, most of the run up in the previous bubble was, was, was a, how far the home price uh, picture got. Price rent to ratio, has, home price to rent ratios have risen a bit, but not, uh, not uh, anywhere near uh, previous bubble levels. So overall, I'm not concerned. Thank you. Thanks very much.